Christy Main, educator at DuPage County Animal Services. Uh, I hold a master's degree in biology with an emphasis in uh, body language, or well, in animal behavior uh, and evolution. I'm working on my doctorate in education with a focus on learning theory. Uh, so I love, I love learning all I can about how we learn and how animals learn um, and how our behavior can influence that process. Uh, I'm also a certified dog trainer and a shelter behavior affiliate, uh, and I love sharing what I know uh, about the animals that I love. So hopefully this will answer any questions that you have about any behaviors that you're seeing at home with your own dogs. All right, so to get us started, uh, we're going to start talking about how dogs really interact with one another. Um, and we're going to start by kind of clarifying some commonly held misconceptions about how dogs view the world and how they view their relationships with one another, as well as with ourselves. Uh, and then we're going to dig into some of our behaviors as well. Uh, and then throughout, you're going to see many lovely pictures of my own dogs. That's what you can see here pictured. So those are my three kiddos, uh, and I will show them off as we go through our presentation. All right, so first off, let's start with how dogs interact with one another socially, and also how they view us in their social structure. So what we have found with dogs when they have been studied in nature, and you'll see I put nature in quotation marks there, uh, because dogs are not a natural species. They're something that we've artificially selected for and bred to perform tasks, whether that be a companion for ourselves or working um, in a specific field. Uh, so there's really no wild version of the dogs that we know in our households. Uh, but we have had some scientists that were able to study quote unquote wild dogs um, in India where there's a high number of feral dog populations uh, as well as in some uh, Native American reservations as well. They have um, some fairly large feral dog populations. So we've been able to see how they would interact with one another in a somewhat natural environment. And what we have found is that dogs actually form pretty loose bonds with one another. So they hang out, they enjoy each other, they may uh, forage together, they may hunt together, they may play, uh, but they'll come and go at will. So when we see dogs living in the wild, uh, they'll come together, they'll live in a group that could range from just a few to large numbers, and then individuals within that group will kind of disappear and then come back later. They might bring a friend with them, and that's all fine with dogs in their social structure. So they're very fluid. Um, they don't have any big concern with who's the boss of who. Um, there's no set hierarchy uh, in dog relationships. So you hear a lot when you work with dog trainers um, and you work with people about establishing relationships with your pet about uh, packs and being the boss in the pack and being the leader. That's not how dogs view each other and that's actually not how they view us at all. Um, and so some of that thought process actually comes from some pretty poorly done science in the 1940s. Uh, so in 1947, uh, scientists had this idea that they wanted to figure out how um, wolves actually interacted with one another. And so how the study was conducted is they actually trapped five wild juvenile male wolves from different areas. So they weren't related, they didn't know each other, and they put them in a zoo in 1947. And a zoo in 1947 was basically just a cinder block box uh, with one sole feeding station and no other enrichment or uh, space to perform natural behaviors. And so what they found was that these wolves, when they were crammed together and only fed from one feeding station, is that the biggest, baddest wolf would come in and he'd eat his fill and chase everybody else away until he was done. And then the next biggest, baddest wolf would come in and chase the others away until he was done. And then the smallest, weakest wolf got the scraps, if anything at all, at the end. So this was bad science. I'm a scientist, this was bad science. So we took animals out of their natural environment. We made no effort to emulate that in captivity. We only fed them once a day from one single feeding station with wolves that were essentially strangers to each other. Uh, but from that study, we developed this whole concept of dominance theory, where we thought that that was how wolves behaved, we assumed that was how dogs behaved, and that formed a, dom a dominance-based training philosophy that unfortunately is still prevalent today. Now, what we found though, when we did appropriate science, is that 
all of those thoughts were wrong. So the study that was done in 1947 was actually followed up on in the 1970s with wild wolves in a natural environment. And what we found out is that wolves actually live in family groups. So there's a mom, a dad, their offspring, uh, and occasionally some non-breeding siblings of mom and dad all live together. And they act very much so like a nuclear family where the older, more mature adults have a slightly larger say than the juveniles that just don't know a whole lot. Uh, but it's not a strict hierarchy uh, and there's no overpowering leader in the group. So we found that that was debunked in wolves. And then when we went on to study dogs, we found that that's not how they behave at all because, well, wolves are wolves and dogs are dogs. So even if wolves did have a hierarchy, dogs aren't wolves. Uh, so thankfully, we've got the science behind us to back up that this was incorrect. But we still see a lot of dominance-based thought processes when we look at dog behavior. And a lot of that comes from us. So humans are very dominance-oriented, right? We always want to know who's the boss of us, who do we get to be the boss of, who's in charge of who. We care about that a lot. And we try to enforce that on our dogs. And let me just start all of this off by telling you, they don't give a fig who's the boss of who. They don't care. That's not how they work. So when you're looking at your dog and you're wondering why they behave a certain way, try to wipe all of that out of your head. It's not because they want to be the boss of you. It's not because they're challenging you for leadership. That's not how dogs think. Uh, so just because, again, I am a science nerd and I like to make sure everybody understands terminology properly, I wanted to throw up an appropriate definition of dominance. So when we're looking at dominance, one, it has to be a quantitative and quantifiable behavior. So that means it has to be something that we can measure and assess. Uh, but all dominance is, when we refer to it in terms of our animal friends, it's the function of gaining or maintaining a temporary access to a resource. So the dog, for example, that I have pictured here does not look very happy. Uh, he is being dominant, not to the person he's growling at, but he's being dominant over the resource that he has. In this particular case, it is his food. He just wants to keep that food and he's telling whoever is approaching him to back off, that is his kibble. Uh, dominant behavior is just about resource gain and it's not aggressive. So dominant behavior does not mean to cause harm. So if we see an animal that is attempting to cause harm, is biting, is lunging, those are overly assertive behaviors and those are more in line with aggression. So that's going to speak to a different biological need that your animal is expressing. Uh, dominance is all just about this is mine, leave it alone until I'm done with it. All right, so now that we've got our basics for how dogs see the world in terms of their social structure, let's start taking a look at how dogs communicate. All right, so dogs are gonna communicate primarily with body language. So vocalizations certainly come in and play a role when we are um, taking a look at how dogs express their needs to one another. Uh, but it's a small role. They are far more interested uh, in communicating with body language almost entirely alone. Um, and when we look at their body language, we can break it up into a couple different types of signals. So you have your play signals, which obviously are indicating when a dog is ready to play. You've got comfort signals. Uh, so those are signs that a dog is happy and relaxed and enjoying their environment. And then we start to get into stress and calming signals, which can indicate that a dog is overwhelmed or overstimulated or stressed out as the signal uh, titles of, um, imply. Or we can see appeasement signals. So these are signs that a dog feels that they are threatened or they're uncomfortable with their environment and they're just trying to demonstrate that they don't mean any harm and they really just wanna be pals and have everybody go back to being kind to each other. And then you've got your early warning signals and your warning signals. So those are the signs that a dog has reached about the end of their tether and they can't handle much anymore. And then finally, those warning signals are those signs that you're going to get right before typically a bite is imminent. So we're going to go through all of these, uh, starting in a happy place, working into those stress and appeasement signals, and then we'll end with some of those more extreme more early warning and then warning signs. So again, let's start in a happy place. I like to start here because this is what we like to see with our animals. So let's talk about play. So you can see my dogs there. So those are my three. This was the last time that it snowed when I woke up in the morning and thought the world had ended and they thought it was great because we, we had spring snow and this was good fun. So these are happy, relaxed dogs. My three have been together for years. They're a good team. They spend a lot of time interacting with one another. Now, 
in play, dogs, just like humans, are going to emulate skills that they need in real life. So for all of us, if we think back when we were children playing games, a lot of times we were doing things like uh, pretending to be vets or doctors or cashiers, or we were fake cooking, uh, maybe tending to a baby. These are all skills that we were going to need when we grew up. Uh, and so they were the things that we played at when we were children. And animals are the same. When they play, they're going to mock, um, they're going to basically mock what they would do in real life. So uh, we call that following the four Fs. So that's fighting, fleeing, fidgeting, and mating because we need to be PC. So those are the ways that we see our animals play. Uh, so as a result though, this can be subsequently misunderstood and punished uh, because again, if they're playing, they're gonna emulate fighting. So that might mean a lot of physical contact. It might mean air snapping. It might be growling at each other and barking. That's okay. Uh, you know, fleeing, that's a lot of crazy manic running around. Fidgeting um, can also be called the foraging. So that's just sniffing and hanging out. And then obviously our mating behaviors, we know what that looks like. Um, but a lot of people misunderstand that. So I definitely see some folks punishing their dogs for being very vocal when they play, if they bark or they growl. I've been to a number of dog parks and daycare centers where the animals are separated for that behavior. But that's all perfectly normal. So some common play signals that you'll see uh, are the play bow, which you may have seen. I'll let the video run again. When my dogs are playing, so you see my two girls running here and my boys watching, then off he goes and then he dips. You saw his elbows go down, his butt went up in the air. That was his signal to Lulabelle, my cattle dog, that he was ready to go. So a play bow is one of my favorite things that dogs do. It's when they put their elbows down on the ground and their bottom straight up in the air. That is the best signal a dog can give you because they are ready to play. Uh, vocalizations can include barking, growling, and whining. So you heard my dog Carmen barking a little bit. She's a very vocal player. Uh, I was hoping I could find another video because when Groot and Lulabelle really get going, they sound quite terrible. There's a lot of growling and deep barking, but they're having a grand time. Uh, so I'll talk to you all about the other body language signals we need to look for. Um, but a lot of times when you're watching our dogs play, I tell everyone, put earmuffs on. Ignore the vocalizations. As long as the rest of the body language is okay, that's fine to hear. Other play signals include bouncy, inefficient movements, and that's one of your biggest tells to know if a dog is actually playing or if they're starting to get irritated or gearing up to fight. So if those vocalizations are scaring you, look at the movement. So when a dog is ready to fight or do damage, they're very purposeful, they're very direct, they're very straightforward in their movements. When they're playing, they're side to side and they're wiggly and there's no real purpose to their movements. They might jump up in the air just for the heck of it. You might see them hit the ground and roll around. So play has no purpose. So it's kind of all over the place and erratic and that's a good way to discern if the activity you're seeing between two dogs is play or if it's starting to lean towards something a little bit more dangerous or hazardous for your pet. Uh, mouthing is completely acceptable. So you'll see a lot of dogs putting mouths on each other. Um, my dogs will grab at each other's faces and they pull their cheeks away from their mouths. It looks terrible and painful, but they keep coming back for more. So I know they're okay. Uh, you just wanna make sure that you're watching. Uh, and we'll talk about this in just a moment that the dog who's getting mouthed is okay with the behavior. Uh, body checks are common, so you would have seen that in my video here as Groot and Lulabelle ran back up onto the deck close to that fence. Lulabelle body checked him, so she swung her big caboose right into his side and knocked him over almost. Uh, that's very common play behavior. Uh, we see that especially in some of our larger breed dogs, and bully breeds love to do the body check thing, so they throw their, they throw their cabooses around quite a bit when they're playing. Uh, and you might also see some muzzle punches where they'll actually take their muzzles and kind of boop each other a little bit. Uh, you see that very commonly in young dogs. As they get older, that's usually perceived as a little bit rude in play, uh, but for puppies and juveniles, that's a very common play behavior. All right, so I had to throw a quick picture up here, uh, here because remember we're looking at the four Fs for playing. So we've got fighting, fleeing, fidgeting, and mating. This is okay if you see this, especially if your dogs are getting kind of amped up. This is actually a behavior that they will do with the mounting and humping to start to break up some tension. So we might have been wrestling really hard, and then we'll start to see some humping behavior to kind of split it apart a little bit. Um, if both parties are comfortable, so that means the humper and the humpy, then we're fine. So if the dog on the bottom there has a big happy smiling face and is wiggling and turning around and trying to interact, they're having a great time. 
leave them be. This bothers us a lot. This is natural behavior in dogs, and it's exactly what you should see when they're playing. Now, if you have concerns and you're not certain whether it's this behavior that you're seeing or you're seeing mouthing or just some really hardcore wrestling and you're not sure if both parties are having a great time, what you can do is what we call a consent test. So you can call the dogs away or gently pull them apart if you've got them on leash and see if the dogs come back together again. So if you can split them apart and they are both eagerly coming back to one another, then they're fine and they're having a good time. So regardless of what you're seeing, they're all okay with it. So you just leave them be and let them play. Now our other happy place for our pets can be found in our comfort signals. So uh, comfort signals are going to indicate that a dog is happy, content, feels safe and secure in their environment. So hopefully this is what we're all seeing when our dogs are at home with us. So you're going to see ears high and back. Uh, so you can see this is my dog, Carmen. She's got her ears kind of back, they're up high. She's engaged with her environment. She's happy to be here. She's excited. This is out after a nice long hike. She's having a good day. She's got a relaxed, open mouth. So it almost looks like she's smiling. Um, so it's loose, it's open, it's happy looking. She's got her tongue hanging out, which is very common. Um, we can also see a loose, wiggly body. Now let me see if I can get this video to start here. All right, so this is a dog that knows his owner's coming through the door. Here comes mom, and then we turn into a giant C. We're almost folding ourselves in half. This is a happy dog. So when we see that loose, inefficient movement, so this is like play again. The dog's excited, he's ready to play, he's interacting with mom. That movement has absolutely no purpose whatsoever. A loose body is a beautiful sign that your dog is happy, relaxed, confident, and eager to interact with you. And then you wanna see a tail at what I call half mast. So I use this video a lot to show people that nice, loose, wiggly body, but I also use it to start a conversation about tails. So working at animal services, we do manage dog bites in the county, and we hear a lot of folks that got bit say, well, I approached the dog because he was wagging his tail. Wagging tails mean the dog's happy to see me. Wagging tails means excited. Tail position is going to tell you if they're excited because they're happy to see you and they're ready to engage and play and get some pets, or they're excited to see you because you look like you might be a tasty lunch. So you have to pay attention to tail position. Tails at half mast is what we're looking for. And when I say half mast, what I'm looking at is the base of a dog's tail. So I don't really give a fig at all about where the tip of the tail is because every dog's gonna hold their tail a little bit different depending on breed, depending on age. There's a whole lot of factors that can go into that. I wanna look at the base of the tail where it meets the spine. And an ideal happy tail with a relaxed, comfortable dog is going to be about even with the spine. So you can see it's just a kind of a straight continuation off the spine. It's not elevated above the spine. It's not tucked below the spine. So you wanna look at that base. And then you can look at the type of wag. So if you notice in the video, that dog's tail was kind of loosely going back and forth in almost big circles. That's a happy wag. We'll see some other dogs later on that are over aroused that are starting to demonstrate some early warning signs. Their tails are going to be a lot stiffer. They're going to be raised up above that half mass position. And instead of that loose wag, it's gonna be very rapid and kind of pointed back and forth. Okay, so we'll pay attention to that as we move along. But loose open wagging, that's a happy dog. Okay. All right, so we started off happy, and I'm usually pretty brief when we look at happy because I think most people are pretty confident in identifying what a happy, comfortable dog looks like. So now we have to start looking into how dogs begin to communicate dis uh, discomfort, and they actually do this in a series. So they tend to work their way up what's called an aggression ladder uh, when they're communicating distress or discomfort. So we're going to work our way up along this and we're going to start with calming and stress signals, which you'll find at the bottom of this ladder. These are the first things that dogs do to let us know that they need a situation to calm down or they're uncomfortable and they need their environment to change. 
And unfortunately, some of these early signals are signs that we miss because frankly, they're just really subtle. And in some cases, they might be things that we have seen in our dogs for years that we've just kind of brushed over because we didn't understand the meaning. Um, and so we just don't notice them any longer. Now, before we talk about stress and calming signals, what I really love to point out is that not all stress is bad stress. So once I go through these signals, if you look at your dog and think, oh no, they do all of these things, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean that your dog is just a giant ball of stress. It could be that they're quite happy and they're excited. So you stress is what's called, uh, what we call good stress, and that could just be excitement. So some dogs will demonstrate some stress and calming signals when you walk in the door after a long day of work because they're so excited and they're going to play and they want to interact with you. You might see some good stress signals right before a meal, uh, right after a good play session. That doesn't mean necessarily that your dog is in um, is in pain or is uncomfortable. It just means that they were pumped up and excited. So stress can be good or it can be bad. And that's when we're going to be talking about distress. So that's bad stress. And that's stress that's going to invoke a fight or flight response in most animals, our dogs included. Um, so we're gonna take a look at um, all of these signals. Just keep in mind that you have to take them in context. So if you just walked in the door and you see your dog throw off some of these signals, they're not under distress, they're demonstrating you stress. Uh, but say you go to the vet and you see some of these signals, then likely taken in context, you're looking at a distressed dog. Okay? Um, now, in both cases, the stress calming and then later on our more severe appeasement signals, the purpose behind these behaviors is to de-escalate a situation. So even when it's you stress and it's good and it's excited, this is kind of a way of a dog self-regulating. So it's like, okay, take a deep breath, Rover. We got to calm down. This is too much. And then they can go back and keep playing. Um, so that's kind of the purpose and the goal behind these behaviors is just to level out, take a moment, you know, take a knee, calm down, and then re-engage in the case of eustress. In the case of distress, this is a first sign that lets, the, uh, lets you know that your dog is looking for that flight or fight um, option, and that's a good opportunity for you to help them choose flight. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. All right, so one of the first and most common stress signals is the lip lick. So it looks just like this. Uh, now, I have a lot of folks ask me how can I tell if my dog is giving me a stress or calming signal when they lick their nose versus how can I tell if they really just want a bite of the slice of pizza that I am eating? So when we are talking about a stress or calming signal with a lip lick, it's very specific and your dog's tongue will come straight out of their mouth, lick their nose and go straight back in versus the that looks delicious lick where the tongue is actually gonna come out the side of their mouth and kind of go around, right? We've all seen our dogs do that, licking their chops because we're having dinner and they'd really like some of that. So that's perfectly happy, that's a normal response. Um, that's just a normal instinctive response to food. Uh, the stress lip lick is very specific. So it's going to come out, we're going to see that tongue lick the nose and go right back in. And for a lot of dogs, that's a really quick, subtle behavior that will be paired with some of these other stress and calming signals. Uh, so you might see your dog turn their head away from you and then that tongue's gonna dart out and lick their nose. That's a clear sign of stress. Now again, it could be you stress. So if they come running at you when you walk through the door and then you see a quick head turn and a lip lick, they're just super excited and they're trying to regulate themselves. Uh, if you're petting a dog or for those of you that have kiddos, if they're playing and you see your dog stop and turn their head and lip, uh, lip lick, they're telling the child that they need to calm down for a moment. So that's why we need to supervise play and help children and dogs take breaks from one another because our kids don't always recognize these signs and they don't always regulate their own body language to match what our dogs are looking for. Okay. Now, other stress and calming signals can include a yawn. And this is another one that can be a little bit confusing for some folks because you know dogs yawn, right? They are gonna get up from a nap, they're gonna take a big yawn. That doesn't mean your dog is stressed. So again, you have to look at context. Was your dog just napping? Did they just get up? Did they just take a stretch? Were they sitting on the couch with you and they're just having a lazy day? Those yawns are just those casual, mellow yawns that we do, right? When you're feeling lazy or you're a little sleepy or you just wake up, we're going to yawn. If your dog is really excited and they're playing or they're out on a walk or you're getting their food ready and all of a sudden they stop and yawn, 
that is a stress signal. And it's actually kind of a cool thing. It's something that all mammals do. I bet some of you, as I'm sitting here saying yawn over and over again, are fighting the impulse to yawn. I actually am fighting the impulse to yawn just a little bit. Uh, and we've all seen that phenomena when somebody yawns, you have to yawn, right? You can't help it. It's in almost instinctive. It's not something that you can control. Somebody yawns, you yawn back. It's something that mammals do. So it helps everybody calm down. So if I yawned and I had a friend sitting here, they're going to yawn too. We've all stopped. We've taken a big deep breath in and it slows our body down. So it is a natural response and all mammals will do it. Now, if you watch this dog, this dog's super excited. So we can see lots of running around, wants to get to whoever's on the other side. But if you notice, there's a lip lick, okay? And then yawn, big yawn, lip lick, lip lick, lip lick again. So you can see there's a couple of stress signals all together there. Uh, but that yawn is certainly taken in that context, a sign of stress or a desire to calm down. Uh, so again, if that dog had just gotten up from a bed and yawned, I wouldn't think anything about it. In this case where she's scrambling around and obviously trying to get to somebody and yawning, she's stressed. She's trying to calm herself down. Okay. Now, some of our other common stress signals okay, are head and body turns. So you can see with this German Shepherd at the bottom of the screen with the boxer, this boxer is actually being a bit rude. So the way that he is approaching the German Shepherd is very straightforward. His body's kind of tense. He's leaning over his front paws. If I was that German Shepherd, I would be uncomfortable too. And so that German Shepherd is expressing that discomfort by turning his head. So he's making a very pointed statement here. I'm not looking at you. You're not there. I refuse to acknowledge you because frankly, you're kind of freaking me out a little bit. So you're going to see that head turn. Uh, for this poor dog here at what I'm assuming is an amusement park, he has taken that a step further and he is turning his whole body away to get away from that, uh, I'm not sure what they're going for there, but that rather scary individual in a costume. That dog is not comfortable uh, and I think he is demonstrating that very clearly and very politely. He is tilting his entire body away to get away from that individual that's making him uncomfortable. Uh, and you actually saw in that video, it was very quick and subtle, but that uh, lab was also doing quite a few head turns as well. So she was getting a little stressed. She's lip licking. She's turning her head away from the individual, I'm assuming is across the room that she was trying to get to, and then yawning. So you'll see a lot of these stress and calming signals will come together and a lot of dogs will use them in specific sequences. Okay. Now, other common stress and calming signals fall under a category of what we call displacement behaviors. So this happens when a dog is stressed or nervous or quite frankly, just doesn't know what to do. So they're going to find an alternative behavior to demonstrate. Uh, so I see this a lot in training classes when a dog is a little overwhelmed because there's other dogs around or they're not understanding what their handler is trying to teach them. We're going to see a lot of displacement behaviors. I also see this in households where maybe the dogs aren't quite getting along, or if a dog meets a new dog and they're not a big fan, you're going to see a lot of alternative displacement behaviors. So a big one is sniffing. Um, and not just your casual sniff that your dogs will do along a walk. Don't be worried if you're taking your dog for a walk and they want to sniff the tree that they're stressed. They're not. That's normal. But it's going to be uh, random sniffing that gets very intense and very specific. So for example, if your dog were to come up and meet another dog and then all of a sudden they both turn and start getting really interested in the ground and sniffing, that's a displacement behavior. They're not sure how they feel about one another. They're not sure how to proceed. So they go straight to sniffing. Uh, you can see that same phenomena with licking and scratching. Uh, so again, not just your general licks. So if your dog's cleaning their paws, they're not stressed, don't worry. Uh, but if maybe there was a loud noise in the house or you drop something and all of a sudden your dog gets really interested in their leg and just starts licking away, that's a displacement behavior. They don't know what to do, so they're going to offer that behavior um, as uh, an alternative to you know, running away or doing uh, you know, something else that maybe would make them equally or more uncomfortable. And we see the same thing with scratching, you know, so nervous dogs all of a sudden get very itchy. I see that all the time when I go into vet hospitals, there's dogs sitting around the waiting room and all of their ears are just very, very itchy. They don't know what to do. They're uncomfortable. So this is kind of the dog equivalent of twiddling your thumbs or biting your nails. Um, you can also see dogs do what's called a urogenital checkout. Um, and this is very common in a lot of animal species. It's an instinctive behavior. When you're nervous, you're uncomfortable, you don't know what to do. 
they actually will start getting very interested uh, in their genital area or their rectal area. So they just start to kind of check out those areas. They might start cleaning there, sniffing, uh, something again that bothers us and sometimes embarrasses us when our dogs do it, but it's perfectly normal. And I expect to see that if my dog is in a situation where they might feel a little bit stressed or out of place. Uh, so in this video, you can see this dog is a little nervous uh, and he's in a training class. And he's not really sure what he's supposed to do. So you can kind of see there's some confusion. So the tail's starting to droop. He's avoiding eye contact. He's head turning. And then all of a sudden, he's super interested in the floor. And then the handler calls him back. Um, and this video cuts short a little bit. But as it extends, uh, the dog actually just becomes very interested in the floor again because he's just not quite sure what he's supposed to be doing. So he offers sniffing as an alternative. Now, other stress signals uh, can include excessive panting. And again, this is another good example of how we have to take these behaviors in context. So if you took your dog outside in an 80 degree day and they're panting like crazy, well, that's normal. They're cooling themselves off. Uh, but if you're inside an air conditioned home or again at the vet's office and your dog is panting, 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 that's a sign of stress. Uh, so this is another dog. Uh, in this particular case, he is actually at a vet hospital. It's perfectly cool. He's been hanging out, laying around. There's no need for this, but he's panting, 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 panting. Uh, in a lot of cases when dogs are stressed, you'll see this pair. There's a lip lick right there um, and a slight head turn. So you'll see a lot of these behaviors paired together. So you see a lot of excessive panting, usually paired with some yawning. You might see some lip licks as well. Or you might see one of my favorite behaviors, which is called a shake off. So a shake off is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so I'll let this video play here for just a moment. Uh, in this particular video, what you're going to see uh, are dogs exhibiting a shake off behavior and it's a way for them to kind of um, dissipate their stress. So we've all probably done it, right? You're, you're prepping for maybe a presentation and you kind of shake off before you go up. Uh, if you've got any sort of stage fright, it's just a way to release some tension. So these kiddos are playing, they're having a grand time. And here in just a moment, one of them is going to knock into that fan in the background. So we'll let that happen here. So they're playing, they bump the fan, it knocks over, big noise, that was a little scary. They're gonna check it out. And then there's that shake off, that was beautiful. And then we see the other dog follow suit. This is one of my favorite stress and calming signals that dogs do because it's infectious, just like the yawn. So you'll see one dog uh, maybe get startled or maybe get a little overwhelmed with play and they whoa, and they shake off and then the other dog will go, oh yeah, okay, let's shake off. Um, and that's also something that's really key to look for if you've got a multi-dog household. If you're seeing them play and one dog pauses and shakes off and the other does not, it might be time to separate them because one dog is communicating, whew, I need, to, I need to release some tension here while the other dog is still going, let's do it, and is kind of going full throttle still. So it might mean that they need a break from one another. Okay. Now, in addition to our common uh, calming and stress signals. We can also see some slightly more pronounced signals that we call appeasement signals. Now, appeasement signals are a clear attempt for a dog to communicate that they're not a threat. It can include those calming and stress signals. Uh, so you might see some of those signals occur um, if your dog is nervous or stressed out. So uh, we see this sometimes in associated with dogs who um, maybe got into the trash or had a potty accident inside. So I see these all the time. I've had people tell me, well, no, my dog knows that they did something wrong because, and they'll demonstrate some of these behaviors. The dogs actually don't know that they did anything wrong. They just know that the mess on the floor makes you angry and you being angry makes them upset. And they just want to get back to a place where they're, they're cool with you again and your friends. So they throw out some appeasement signals, maybe paired with some calming and stress signals to let you know that they're not a threat, they didn't mean it, and they just want to be pals again. So appeasement signals can include squinting or blinking. Uh, so I grabbed this picture really quick off the internet and I actually feel terrible for this dog. So somebody's obviously trying to take a picture of their pooch. This dog is super stressed out. So we see kind of a tight body posture. We see the hunkered over head. Uh, that right front leg almost looks like it's about ready to pick up, which is another stress signal. So we call that a paw raise. And this poor dog is squinting at this person. 
squinting, uh, again, in context, if they're looking directly at the sun, squinting is just squinting. But if we're indoors, we're not facing the sun, and they start to squint or blink excessively, that is a sign of stress. That's an appeasement signal. That's a dog kind of trying to tell you, hey, man, please back up a little bit. I didn't mean it. Let's just go back to being pals. Uh, smiling is another really common behavior uh, that I see associated with appeasement. Uh, and this is common in all animals. So humans are the only animals that show their teeth when they are happy. So we peel our lips back and smile to demonstrate that we are having a good time and we're happy. Other animals don't. So when they show their teeth like this, it is either what's called a fear grimace uh, or again, with dogs, we call them appeasement signals. It's a demonstration of discomfort and a desire for everyone to lower their energy levels. Now, that being said, I have seen some people train their dogs to do this. If this is a behavior that you have developed a cue for, that is fine. You're not hurting your dog by doing that. But if it's something that they start to demonstrate naturally, um, you might want to examine what's going on in their environment that's causing that behavior to occur. And then our last appeasement signal is our most severe and one that can be, sometimes be misinterpreted. Um, so I wanted to throw this out here so everyone can see in a video. This dog is doing a beautiful tap out. So this individual is filming and approaching. So you see the dog doing a lot of head turning. There were some slight paw raises. And then she flops over on her back and shows her belly. And then she flops over, or excuse me, he flops over on his back and shows his belly. This is what's called a tap out. Uh, and I actually feel really bad for this dog. This dog is highly conflicted because he obviously wants attention. He probably knows the person that's filming, but he's very uncomfortable. So every time that person approaches too close, you can see that the dog throws himself back on his back. And a lot of folks have a hard time with this because how do you tell the difference between that and a dog just simply rolling over because they'd like you to pet their belly? And a lot of it is in context, one. And then two, in looking at some of that other body language. So do we have a happy open mouth? Is the tongue out? Do we have those high up and backwards ears? Did we see loose, inefficient movement as the dog approached? So if a dog's happy and wants a belly rub, they're going to be bending themselves into C's. They're going to have that nice, loose, waggy tail. They're going to approach. They're probably going to rub on you. They're going to solicit attention. And then they're going to go into that belly rub position. If they are throwing themselves on the ground like this dog was very rapidly and kind of tense and stiff and exposing their belly, that's a tap out. That's a dog telling you, please, please don't hurt me. I don't mean you any harm. Can we just please be friends? So when we see that type of behavior, again, this is one of the reasons I feel bad for this dog, we need to walk away and leave them alone because we are the stressor that's causing that behavior. So in this dog's case, it could be the person or it could be the camera or phone that they're holding to video the dog's behavior that's making the dog uncomfortable. But either way, that dog is very clearly asking for some space and it's not being provided. So we need to be very conscious of that when we're working with our dogs. And then the last appeasement signal that I threw up on the list, uh, I don't have a picture or video for because we all know what it looks like, uh, would be submissive urination. Um, so when we see our animals, maybe our dog's meeting a new dog or meeting a new person and they do that little bit of piddle, that's an appeasement signal. So it's just saying, I'm no threat to you. So can we just please be pals? Uh, and it's something that I really stress to people, make sure we're not punishing that because that is a stress related behavior. Even if it's a dog that's piddling when you just got home, uh, they are super excited. They're a little overwhelmed. And one of the ways they know to communicate that is through a little bit of a piddle. Uh, so we wanna make sure we don't punish that behavior because we can actually exacerbate it later on. Okay. So now that we've moved through our lower end of our aggression ladder, we've gone through some stress and calming behaviors, we've gone through some appeasement behaviors, now we need to get into some of our warning signs. So early warning signs are usually going to be um, stemmed from either fright or over arousal. So either our dog is scared or they're getting a little overly interested, overly enthusiastic or overly tense about a situation. Uh, now, when we see these early warning signs, the one thing that I like to make sure everyone understands is that dogs are fight or flight creatures. Um, there's a few other options in there in terms of their behavioral responses, but fight or flight are the two big ones. And they will almost always choose flight unless that flight is actually or perceived to be impossible. So for example, we see a lot more dogs have behavioral issues on leash than say in a backyard or at a park. I have people tell me that all the time. You know, my dog is great. I can take him to a dog park. He loves other dogs, but I see a dog on leash and my dog turns into a monster, right? 
it's because flight is impossible. The dog perceives that there's no other option. So if they are stressed, nervous, or frustrated, we've created a circumstance where fight is their only option. So that's why we start to see some of that reactivity behavior. Uh, we can also see fight chosen over flight if it's a learned behavior. So if it's a dog that has been pushed to that point where they feel like they have to bite to make their point, um, if they've done that and then they've successfully managed to control the environment in a way that they originally wanted, they're going to continue to fight. Um, so when we see dogs that have really bad resource guarding issues, so they don't let anybody near their food bowl, usually that's exacerbated if they were able to bite somebody once and then they got all the food or somebody dropped the bowl of kibble on the ground and they were able to just go to town, they're going to start to bite more regularly or demonstrate more of a fight inclination than a flight one. And then we can see fight being more common if our dogs are experiencing intense over arousal. So if they are always in a hyper aroused state, they're more likely to choose fight over flight. Okay. So we're going to go through some early warning signs. I've broken them down into fear-related signs and over-arousal signs. Um, I like to stress, again, these signals don't always necessarily predict a bite, but these are the two emotional states that dogs experience where they're most likely, if not listened to, and if the environment is not changed, most likely going to be provoked into a more extreme response. So when we're looking at fear signs, uh, fearful body language is usually pretty clear, and I think a lot of us will intuitively recognize it. Uh, so you're going to be looking at a dog like this poor kiddo here. So this is a dog from uh, one of our shelter uh, partners. Uh, head and body is very low. Uh, so I always, when I work with children, I, t I ask them how many of them have hid under covers before when they've had a bad dream or thought there was a monster under the bed. We've all done it, right? Uh, dogs don't have covers to hide under, so they try to almost melt into the floor. Um, and in some very extreme cases, they'll actually flop completely flat on the ground. We call that pancaking. Um, it's something, again, we see a lot in high stress environments, so vet hospitals, Sometimes when dogs are brought into the shelter, um, this is entirely overwhelming and new for them. We see a lot of that flattening behavior. Um, but in a slightly less extreme form, you'll see what this dog is doing here. So we've got the head and the body is low, close to the ground. The tail is all the way down. You might see that sometimes more extreme and tucked underneath the body. Uh, this dog is demonstrating very nice paw raise. So you can see that right front paw is up. That's a sign of fear and discomfort. More common in little dogs than big, uh, but any dog can demonstrate that. Uh, you'll also see that the dog's weight is back, so it's resting over his haunches, and he's giving us what's called a whale eye. Uh, so whale eye means that we can see the whites of their eyes. Um, so a lot of dogs will do that. They'll, they'll actually open their eyes a little wider. And in many cases, they want to try to sort of look away from what's scaring them, but they can't help themselves, and they're going to turn and look back, and that's what causes us to see the whites of their eyes. Um, so this is another example of a fearful dog. Uh, I wanted to show this um, additionally. So you can see what a fearful dog looks like when they're laying down. So again, you still see that, you know, the ears are back, the head is low. We're seeing a little bit of that whale eye. And if you notice, we've lost that nice, happy, open mouth. We've got a closed mouth. And here we have the same thing with the weight distribution. So our dog has weight mostly back. And one way that you can tell that a dog is fearful or just uncomfortable when they're laying down is if they're trying to keep their back end underneath them. So a comfortable dog is going to lay more on their side and let those back legs stretch out because they don't feel like they need to get up and get away in a hurry. A fearful dog is going to try to keep their back paws underneath them so they can get up and jump away quickly if they need to. Uh, and then I just threw in this dog too, so you can see a more pronounced version of that whale eye. So again, you've got the whites of the eye showing. This dog is very, very concerned about whatever is going on over his back end there. Um, so these are definitely some clear signs uh, that typically will follow some of those stress signals. So if you've got a dog, again, demonstrating distress, not you stress. So Again, let's think vet hospitals, or if we've got a lot of strangers over, maybe we're having a party, you've seen those lip licks, the head turns, the yawning, you might start to see behaviors becoming a little bit more extreme. So they might see some crouching, head and tail down, that whale eye tends to follow right behind those stress signals as well. Now, 
if these behaviors are not listened to. Um, so this is a big reason that I advocate uh, for any dog guardian to make sure that you are working very closely uh, with your pet professionals in your life, whether that's a groomer or a veterinarian uh, that can recognize these stress and fear signals and is willing to work around that and take their time with their animal. Uh, if that doesn't occur and we're not listening to these fear signals, we can have an animal that demonstrates what we call a complete shutdown. Uh, and this is an example of learned helplessness. Uh, so for those of you that are not familiar, learned helplessness just simply means that an animal is in an environment or circumstance that they'd like to get out of, but they have learned that there's no option. Um, so we have seen this uh, come about in some studies with dogs that were done oh, I believe it was in the 60s, uh, where they actually put dogs in a small box uh, with a floor that could be electrified. Uh, and the dog started off by having a shelf that they could jump off the floor when the electrical current went through uh, to protect themselves. But eventually over time, they actually took those shelves down and they kept shocking the dog, um, the floor. So it was shocking the dogs and the dogs had no route to escape. And over time through learned helplessness, the dogs actually stopped trying. So when they were getting shocked, they would actually just lay down on the floor and kind of accept it. Uh, so we can see that though in our own pets under less extreme circumstances. So if every time they go to the vet and they need to get their nails done and we see vet techs holding them down and pinning them to the floor, we can see learned helplessness develop as a result. Uh, so it comes from a, a lack of agency, so not allowing our dogs to choose, not providing that flight option for them. And it can sometimes be difficult to see because in many cases, we think that dogs are being good. So let me go ahead and go through. I wanted to look at one of my, see if I can get this here. Oh, so this is an example of some bad training here. Uh, so you can see this is uh, what's called, um, oops, sorry. This was a, a way that we were seeing dogs trained to relax. Um, and this goes back to that dominance theory. So this puppy wants to get up and this owner's being told to gently restrain the dog, hold it down. So he wants up, he wants up, he wants up. And then she removes the pressure and the dog stops trying to get up. That dog was not relaxed that dog was shut down. So the dog gave up. Uh, this is another example at a groomer. So this dog is actually very, very scared um, and is shut down because he hasn't been provided choice. And you can see the groomer, unfortunately, is being a little bit sarcastic. Uh, but that dog is shut down. So that dog is not a good dog. That dog is not relaxed and comfortable with the process. That dog has given up fighting. Um, and shut down dogs, you can actually tell the difference between that and relaxation because they're going to have, again, a lack of those happy signals. No ears high and up, no soft, relaxed eyes, no open, smiling mouth. They're going to be fairly tense. And a lot of times you'll see sort of a blank look in their eyes. And shut down dogs can actually be physically manipulated. Uh, so that dog there on the table, with that groomer, if she wants him to stand up, she'll be able to just lift, lift him up. She'll be able to put a hand underneath his belly, push him up into a standing position, and he'll stand exactly where she put him because he's learned that no matter what he does, this is going to happen to him anyways. So he is shut down and mentally he is checked out and he is no longer there. Uh, and while this might give us the results we want in terms of their care, there's much better ways and mentally healthier ways to work with our dogs to get them to uh, accept um, you know, care behavior. So seeing the vet, seeing the groomer, etc. cetera. Okay. Now, if we are working with a fearful dog, so you have a dog demonstrating some of these behaviors, I always like to throw in a few safety tips. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that we're avoiding contact. So this is another thing that I see, again, working at animal services that leads to a lot of bites. So a lot of dogs bite their own owners in the vet clinic, for example. They're afraid and we're humans and we want to hug and snuggle and cuddle all of that fear away for them. But the last thing a fearful dog wants is touch. So you can see this is a fearful dog. Somebody's leaning towards it, uh, towards it and you can even see that dog is trying to duck away. Does not want that interaction. So if we are encountering a fearful dog or if our dog is demonstrating these fearful behaviors, be conscious of your own body language. So an indirect gaze is best. So avoid direct eye contact. Try to watch them more out of the corner of your eye. Make your body small if possible. So if you're standing, crouch or sit down. Uh, you can try to curl into yourself a little bit. Do a slight turn away. Expose your side to the dog. And then try to be quiet 
or completely silent, um, which flies in the face of everything that we do instinctively. We want to hug, we want to cuddle, we want to snuggle and give kisses, we want to talk to our dogs and those sweet baby voices that we use. That is a nightmare for fearful dogs. So make sure that you fight those instincts and try to maintain a calm, cool, collected uh, posture. Again, avoid that direct gaze and allow the dog to find that comfort that it needs. And it might need, again, an option for flight. So give them an opportunity to hide, back away from whatever it is that is making them fearful. Okay, so now we're working our way up that aggression ladder. So we started in the beginning with our calming and stress signals. Then we went through our appeasement signals uh, and we've done a little bit of our fear related early warning signs. Now we want to look into over arousal as a warning sign. Okay, So if your dog is over aroused and that could be overly fixated on something like a squirrel, it could be a stranger, it could be another dog, it just could be a heightened state. So if a dog has had a lot of things going on in their day, uh, we call that trigger stacking. So it's one thing on top of another that's just adding to their stress. And that can result in what we call an over aroused dog. So if your dog is over aroused, uh, over excited, over interested, you're going to see a stiff body. Their weight is going to be forward. So you can see this dog here in the picture is almost pushing forward onto his front paws. He's very interested in whatever it is that's going off in the distance. Ears are forward. Uh, now I know with this dog it's kind of hard to tell because he's a floppy-eared kiddo, but his ears are rotated forward. Uh, you also a lot of times see piloerection in an over-aroused dog, uh, and that is hackling. So you'll start to see the hair standing up on the back of their um, along their spine, excuse me, and that can be right between their shoulder blades, it can be by the base of their tail, uh, and in some dogs it might be both with a little bit of a down spot in between, and some dogs can actually raise all of the fur along their spine. Um, now, if you are seeing your dog in an over-aroused state, think about how, again, you could be affecting that. Uh, so we can sometimes inadvertently um, increase our dog's over-arousal. So this is where we see a lot of leash issues uh, with folks and their dogs. Um, our leash handling can cause over-arousal. So if your dog sees a squirrel or another dog and you start to see that head come up, maybe the body stiffen, they start to pull and lean forward, the more you grab at that leash and tighten it and pull them close to you, the more you're increasing tension. You're increasing tension in your own body and your posture, and then you're increasing tension in that leash, which is only going to exacerbate that condition for your dog. Uh, and actually by pulling back on that leash, you're allowing them to further lean forward and put more weight over their front legs, which is just gonna hype them up more because now they're in that aroused body position and they're gonna start to feed off of that. Uh, we also, again, have to be cognizant of our voice. So if a dog is over-aroused, we don't want to add excitement to that by uh, using our voice. You know, I see a lot of folks walking their dogs. I understand the frustration when they're pulling, but if we're yelling stop or knock it off or get over here or anything like that, we're adding more um, tension and excitement to that already over-aroused state. Okay. All right. And then we need to move into some of our more intense warning signs. So now we're moving up to that very top of the ladder. And these are usually the last signals that a dog will give before they bite, before they instigate in a fight. Again, assuming that flight option is either actually not there for them or is perceived to not be available. Uh, so these warning signs are basically a dog's version of yelling. Uh, it tends to be very purposeful and direct, again, to differentiate it from playtime, where you might see some similar behaviors of barking, growling, mouthing uh, that's more uh, boisterous and seems inefficient. Warning signs are going to be very direct. You're not going to be questioning what they're doing and why they're doing it. Okay. So warning signs can include quite a few more signals than just this, but this is some of our more common signals. So we can have a hard stare, a freeze. We can see the commissure either move to extremely, uh, extremely forward position or an extreme backward position. Uh, you'll see snarling and lip curls. And then you also see a lot of barking, snapping, growling, and lunging uh, as your kind of ultimate warning signs before a bite. So we'll go through each one of these because they are some of the most important uh, for safety reasons. I want to make sure everyone can get an example of what I am referring to. So here's our first warning sign, the hard stare. Uh, so the dog uh, right here on uh, my left, uh, should be everybody's left I think, um, is giving us a hard stare. 
Now, I cheated and I picked a dog that has blue eyes to make it very, very clear what we're looking for. But in a hard stare, we are actually looking at a dog that is highly over aroused, probably agitated, and that actually causes blood vessels to restrict in their eyes, which gives them a very clear, crisp looking pupil. So you can see there's a clear border between the pupil and the iris. I can see where one starts and, uh, and stops and then the other begins where this dog is giving me what I call soft eyes. This dog is happy to see us. He's got nice high back ears, he's got a happy open mouth, and his eyes are soft. So you can see when you are looking at the dog, his pupils actually look a little bit blurry. So there's no clear defining line between the pupil and the iris. Uh, so that is our clear defining um, feature of a hard versus soft eye. Now, this can sometimes be tricky to discern, um, especially say if a dog is approaching, maybe we don't want to get that close to their face to see if we can see the difference between their pupil and their iris. Uh, you can also tell if a dog is giving you a hard stare and is giving you that clear warning sign because their gaze will be unwavering. So most dogs, when they're happy and they're relaxed and they're looking at you, they're looking and then they go, oh, huh, look at that, or oh, over there, or there's my friend, right? They're not just fixated on you. The hard stare is a warning sign you are the only thing in their universe and they're gonna focus right directly on you and not turn away. Okay, so our next warning sign is called a freeze. Uh, so this video, um, this is a trainer who actually did this as a demonstration with her own dog, which I'm not a huge fan of because she knows what she's doing is irritating her dog and I would never encourage this, but it is a really good example of what a freeze looks like. So this particular dog is a resource guarder. So he doesn't like people or other animals around his stuff. He's been given a raw bone to work on and his mom keeps approaching him. So let's fast forward here just a little bit. So let's see here. All right, so she's gonna try to pet him while he's got his bone, so he's relaxed. And then do you see he froze immediately? So he's looking, he saw her coming, his mouth shut, and he kind of gave her a little bit of a wail and he froze. There's another freeze right there. He stops moving and then lip lick. Now she's giving him a cue. She's asking him to roll over on his side. He gave her a low growl to let her know he's uncomfortable. There's another lip lick. There was a freeze. Uh, he's got whale eye going on. That body is stiffening. He's not happy with her. Uh, so freezes are something that dogs do um, sometimes almost as a last warning sign. So if I was her and I was approaching my dog and my dog stopped what they were doing and froze and looked at me like that with a whale eye and gave me a lip lick, I would immediately say, I'm sorry, and I would back up because that dog is very clearly telling her that if you continue to do this, I'm probably going to be compelled to snap at you because this is mine and I want you to go away. Uh, so you'll see this quite a bit uh, with dogs that are not interested in sharing whatever resource they have. Um, or you can sometimes see this in play too. So if dog play gets too boisterous, one individual will typically stop. And it sometimes is just for a second or two, but it's a stop, it's a freeze, it's saying, let's calm down, I've had enough. And then if the other dog is receptive, you'll usually see a shake off. Sometimes play will resume. Sometimes they might start sniffing. They might do something else. Uh, but this is a clear warning sign that that animal has had enough um, of whatever stimulus is occurring in their world. Nope. Oops. There we go. Okay, so freezes will occur uh, when animals are under high stress. And just like you saw in the video, it's usually paired with some other calming or stress signals. So you usually won't just see a freeze out of the blue. It'll be paired with a yawn, lip licks very commonly, whale eyes are usually associated with that. And many dogs, when they freeze, will automatically turn their head. So if I'm uncomfortable with something up here in front of me and I uh, wanna demonstrate that with my body, I'm gonna freeze, but I'll turn my head first. So I'll do kind of one of those for a second. And I'll give you the whale eye while I'm doing it. Okay. All right, so let's move on then to our next warning signs. So that is our commissure motion. So a lot of people look at me like I'm nuts and they wanna know what a commissure is. A commissure is just a fancy word for the corner of your mouth. Uh, so again, we saw that happy dog with those nice relaxed lips that were loosely back, but not purposely pulled back. Uh, when a dog is giving a warning sign, there's a lot more tension in their lip line. So you can see the commissure go forward. So you can see the corner of the lip, which naturally would likely be about here is pushed all the way forward. So they're kind of pursing their lips. This dog is also giving us some other very clear warning signs that looks like a freeze. That dog looks pretty stiff. The ears are back. And again, we've started to see that whale eye as well. So I see whites of the eyes. This um, is usually associated with some vocalization. So if a dog starts to growl, their commissure comes forward typically. 
Uh, we can also see our dogs as usually as the commissure goes forward, they'll start to do some snarling. We might get a little bit of a lip curl um, and you can tell that this is an unhappy dog based on that wrinkling that we're seeing along the muzzle and also in between the eyes. Um, that's a dog that's letting us know that they're not thrilled with their environment at the time. And if these are not listened to, so this is usually what happens first, we're going to growl, we're going to push our commissures forward, we might lip curl, I'm starting to show you the business a little bit, right? So this is a warning sign, you're not listening to me, I'm going to show you my teeth because I feel like I might have to bite you, right? So if I'm a dog, this is my step two here. Then if that's not listened to, we get the commissure back. So this is a dog that has their lips all the way pulled back. And we know that they mean business and this is not a smile, this is not a submission or um, a calming signal, uh, this is not a happy smiling mouth because we can see the molars. So anytime a dog pulls their lips back and you can see their back molars, you're in trouble. Okay, so this is a dog that's telling you I have, I've had it, this is the straw that broke the camel's back, if this does not change, I'm going to be forced to bite. Okay. All right. So then, oh, let me see if I can get my video to play here. So then our last warning sign, oh, let me see if I can get this going here, would be our vocalizations. So this is a dog that's growling. He's resource guarding, but you can see there is a little bit of a lip curl. He's showing his teeth. He's wrinkling up his muzzle. There's vocalizations. Oh, and there we go. So the next step following those vocalizations, so in this case, growling, he did a little bit of a light bark. Um, He's showing his teeth. That other little dog in the environment wasn't listening and approached while he was eating. You saw him actually snap at that dog. Um, so that's actually called an air snap. He didn't mean any harm um, at that particular moment. It was a warning. So he snapped at the dog, but did not actually make contact. Uh, so that's something that we also see as a very common warning sign. Uh, dogs will snap at the air before they snap at the individual, whether that's human or animal, that is causing them distress and making them uncomfortable or angry. One of the things I like to stress, and hopefully we've seen this as we've seen that ladder of aggression, or what I more like to call it a ladder of discomfort, um, is that dogs don't bite out of the blue. So they have these whole series of steps that they go through before they get to a bite. Dogs don't want to bite us or other animals any more than we want to get bitten. So dogs do not bite out of the blue. Unless, so I always like to throw in some of these caveats for folks so we know what to do and what not to do with our animals. Uh, we want to make sure we don't punish warning signs. So if we see a dog that is giving us a lip curl, if they're growling, if they're showing us their teeth and we yell at them or we punish them or we throw them in a cage, all that they're really learning to do is to not warn us before they bite. Um, and not only does that put uh, humans and other animals in greater danger, because now we have an animal that is just going to react uh, immediately without throwing off any, any warning signs, uh, but we're also creating an environment where our dog has no mental health at all because any ability that they've had to express themselves is being diminished. So we wanna be conscious of that when we are working with our animals. Dogs don't bite out of the blue. They give us a lot of signals. We have to make sure that we listen and that we allow them that opportunity to express displeasure or discomfort. Okay. So I've always loved this quote. I never knew who started it, but punishing a growl is like taking the batteries out of a smoke alarm, right? We want our smoke alarms to go off to let us know that there's a fire. I want my dog to growl at me so I know that I've done something wrong and I can change the environment or change my actions to make him happier and me happier and safer. Uh, so definitely make sure you're listening to our animals and we don't punish when they tell us that they're unhappy. Okay. Um, so really quick, I like to throw in a little bit of a stay safe tip. Um, so if you do happen to encounter a dog um, that is especially not your own, that's demonstrating a lot of these signals, uh, this is from uh, dogonsafe.com and it is for kids, but I love it because it's a great image. I always tell folks to be a tree uh, when you are trying to be safe around dogs that are demonstrating some of these warning signs or perhaps indicating they're inclined to bite. Uh, so stand in one location, don't move around, do not run, uh, fold your branches, so get your hands either tucked in front of you, I'm a big fan of putting them in your pockets or hold them behind your back, watch your feet, um, so that way you look down, you're avoiding direct gaze, um, and you can still watch the dog out of the corner of your eye. What we're doing is we're providing a dog a flight option. I mean, you know harm. I'm not looking at you. I'm not facing you. If you're angry, please go away. You do not have to fight. Um, so make sure that you are minding your body language. So 
turn to the side, indirect gaze, no or slow movements. Uh, with possible, slowly step behind a barrier. And if you are trying to walk away from a dog that is upset, do it slowly and do it to the side. So I always advocate never back away from a dog that is unhappy with you. You don't know what's behind you. You might trip and fall, which could exacerbate the situation. Sidestep so you can see where you're going while still indirectly watching your dog. Okay. All right, now when we are looking at body language, there are some challenges that you might encounter. Uh, so I always like to cover those. Uh, breed differences is a big one. Um, so bully breeds, like my friend Carmen here, um, they tend to be a little stiffer than others. So we're talking about our Staffordshires. Um, we can also even throw in different Mastiffs, Dogos, and even some of our larger breeds like uh, Rottweilers. We bred them to be big and thick and heavy. So when we're looking for that happy, comfortable body language, those loose wiggles, things like that, they're not physically built to do that very well. Uh, so you have to know your dog's uh, breed and background, look at their body type, uh, and make sure you're using that um, in context to assess their body language and the cues that they're giving you, uh, because we might see some physical differences in how dogs respond just based on the way that they're built. Uh, and then, of course, you can see things like this Commodore here. I have no idea what that dog is trying to tell me right now because I can't see him. Um, so we can see that when our shaggy kiddos as well, Old English Sheepdogs, uh, if they're not well manicured, um, they can be kind of difficult to read body language wise. So you just have to do the best you can with a dog like this one. I would be looking at the body movement. Are you bouncing around? Are you loose and inefficient? Are you very direct and purposeful in where you're going? It's going to help me kind of assess your mood and your state of being at that time. Uh, we also have to look at the modifications that we have done to our dogs. So docked tails are really hard to read because I can't tell what they're doing. Is it tucked? Is it up? Is it wagging? Is it not? How is it wagging? I have no idea because we've cut most of it off. Um, so that can be a concern as well as docked ears. Same thing. Um, we've limited their range of motion. We've taken away a dog's ability to communicate with us uh, when we've done these things. Um, so then as dog guardians, uh, individuals who want to interact with dogs, we have to start looking at some other features. So make sure you're taking in that whole body um, and trying to keep as much of it in context as possible with the limitations brought about by these modifications. Okay. And then of course you can see dogs that provide us with mixed signals. Um, so a dog might at the same time demonstrate stress and play signals. Um, this is uh, an example of a conflicted dog. So a dog that's not really sure what they're about. Uh, and this video demonstrates this. So this dog is a little unsure. She kind of wants to hang out with this person but she's not sure how she feels about it. So we've got sort of a stiffer body, uh, but again, taken in context, we've got a Rottweiler here, so I'm not surprised that the body is stiff, uh, but the ears are kind of down. We've got a closed, tight mouth. There's a little bit of a whale eye going on there. Um, there's a lip lick right there. So she kind of continues to do this throughout this engagement. So this is a dog that's throwing off a few mixed signals. So she's approaching, so that seems to be that she's giving consent for this petting and this interaction, but her body's remaining stiff. She's kind of curling away from him a little bit. She's lip licking. So this is a conflicted dog, a dog that wants attention, but maybe not from that individual, or she's not sure if she's comfortable with that individual. Um, so in this particular case, I would advocate for that gentleman taking his hands off of her uh, and seeing if she comes back to solicit more attention or if she does try to back away from him. So we wanna make sure that she has that agency. And again, the knowledge that flight is an acceptable option here. There we go. And then of course, when we're interpreting dog body language, we also have to take in our own body language also. Uh, so when you're looking at how your dog is reacting to you and how you're interacting with your dog, you have to be cognizant of your own body language because dogs are gonna pay way more attention to that than any vocal cues that you might give. So think about your approach. Uh, if you watch dogs greet each other politely, they never come head on. They actually come around to the side. So we can do the same thing. No direct approaches to our animals, we can be a little looser, a little more nonchalant, make more of a C shape as we approach them. How is our posture? Are we leaning over them? Are we standing up very, very tall and stiff? That can impact how a dog perceives us. Um, we can also think again about our stature. Are we very tall and looming over the dog? Is it possible for us to make ourselves smaller? Can we sit down? That'll make a dog more relaxed. Vocalizations are also something we need to consider. Dogs typically only vocalize in extreme circumstances when they're very happy and excited and playing or they're distressed or angry or otherwise upset. So we tend to talk quite a bit. We have to remember our dogs don't. So calmer voices and more quiet time is beneficial in our interactions with our animals.
Uh, we also have to make sure that we are avoiding direct eye contact. So for the most part, dogs are going to find that uncomfortable. Uh, so you want to do more of a sideways and direct gaze with your dog, uh, unless you're specifically working on something like eye contact with your animal, then you're going to be a little bit more direct. But again, keep in mind that dogs don't hold direct eye contact very long naturally. So we want to make sure we don't expect that from our dogs at home with us. Uh, and then pay attention to physical contact. So allow your dogs can, um, to go through consent tests, pet for three seconds and wait. Do they come back? Do they allow you to continue petting and touching or do they move away and stay away? Um, we need to allow them that agency. So again, they have that flight option always and fight doesn't ever have to be an option. This is especially critical when we're looking at care. So things like nail trims, for example, allow your dog the opportunity to pull away. It'll only help you in the long run. Uh, and with this too, I also like to throw out, uh, and most people are not thrilled with this, but dogs do not like to be hugged. So we have to pay attention to that. Now, that being said, I'll change that up a little bit. Most dogs don't like to be hugged. There are going to be a few weirdos out there that enjoy it. They get in there. They like that contact. I have one. His favorite thing in the world when I come home is he comes, home, he comes up to me and presses his forehead into my chest. He likes to be cuddled. Um, and that's fine. So for him, I do it. Most dogs don't. So primates, humans included, are the only species on the planet that find comfort from chest to chest contact. Other animals actually view that as a sign of aggression. So we want to be careful with our dogs. A lot of times when I see dogs in households with kiddos, I see the kiddos come up and do that big wraparound hug and I see dogs pulling their head away, giving whale eye, lip licking, yawning. They're very uncomfortable. Now, the last thing that you can consider with your own body language is calming signals. So if a dog yawns at you, you can yawn back. And that's actually something that can help calm them down. Uh, if they're head turning or body turning away from you, you can do the same. Give them space, turn your body away a little bit. It's an acknowledgement of how they're feeling um, and it'll allow them time to calm down. Okay. Now, very quickly, I just wanted to touch on a couple common behavioral disorders that we see in dogs. Uh, so things that are abnormal uh, when we're looking at some of these signals that they can provide. And I picked just a couple um, because of this reason here. Um, the stigma is really strong when we talk about behavioral disorders or mental disorders in dogs. We certainly see that in people. We know that that stigma is out there. A lot of people feel embarrassed if they have a mental health issue, and they absolutely shouldn't. It's simply a biological um, need that we need to address. There's a chemical imbalance, we need to treat it. Um, but there is definitely that stigma involved with humans and it's even stronger when it is in animals. So nobody bats an eye if a dog is struggling with a chemical imbalance for their thyroid or pancreas. So they're diabetic or they're hyper or hypothyroid. Um, but if they have a chemical imbalance in their brain or adrenal glands, which can lead to behavioral disorders, we tend to dismiss them. There's no way it's a dog. Of course, they can't have a mental health dis disorder. They absolutely can. So science is on our side, um, and it has demonstrated that mental illness exists in all species, not just humans. And if you're having a behavioral issue with your animal at home, it is highly likely that it is rooted in a mental disorder. Uh, so that's something that's important to address because you might need to not only approach that with a behavioral management plan or a training plan, um, you might also need to seek out some medical interventions. This is where we would wanna get a veterinarian involved as well. Uh, so anxiety is super common and probably one of the most common things that I see in dogs that go untreated. Um, it's very common in all animals. Uh, it's the result of low serotonin in the brain, and it can result in a variety of, of odd behaviors. So dogs that pace, whine, destructive behaviors. Um, so I hear that a lot. I left the house and my dog chewed through the sofa because he was mad at me. The dog didn't chew up the sofa because he was mad. The dog chewed up the sofa because he was anxious because you left him. Um, so it's something that we need to address. And that can be addressed through training and behavioral management. But as a trainer, when I've helped people with these issues, the first place I send you is to a veterinarian because we're going to need some pharmaceutical support while we work on the training and behavior modification. And there's no shame in that. I'm a trainer. I've worked with dogs most of my life. I have a dog who's on anxiety meds and will probably be on anxiety meds for the rest of her life. It's not her fault. It's not a reflection on me. She has a chemical imbalance in her brain and that's okay to help her be the best, happiest dog she can be. I address that pharmaceutically. So again, treatment plans, you're going to look at training and behavior modification, but it's going to be alongside with medication. So those are usually serotonin reuptake inhibitors or nervous system depressants. Um, again, something that can be prescribed by a veterinarian and can be very useful, sometimes just in the short term while you work on that training plan, and sometimes it's a lifelong change. Okay. 
Uh, we can also see compulsive behaviors, which is something that unfortunately we see a lot in dogs. Um, and it's, it's upsetting and it's sad. Um, so compulsive behaviors are also called stereotypies or stereotypical behaviors. It's just a repetitive behavior that's performed to an unhealthy level. So it might be something a dog should do naturally. They just do it too much and too in excess. Um, so repetitive barking, excessive licking, pacing. Uh, so I found this picture online. It was from one of those dog shaming websites where this dog licks the couch a lot. And I know it was meant to be funny, but that's actually kind of sad. That's a compulsive behavior. And that dog is demonstrating that he is experiencing some level of mental distress. And that's why we're seeing that compulsive couch licking behavior. Um, it can be a byproduct of untreated anxiety, or it could be another condition. Again, something that we would want to make sure that we're addressing with a veterinarian. Now, the biggest key component here is making sure that we don't punish those behaviors. So I know a lot of people would probably not be happy to come home and see their couch soaked like this couch is, but that dog is demonstrating mental and health. And just like we wouldn't punish a person for seeking out counseling, for example, we can't punish a dog for doing the same in the only way they know how to do. Okay. So punishment in these cases is likely to only either increase the behavior because we're upping that anxiety or subdue it. So the dog might stop because they know they're going to get in trouble, but we're not addressing that underlying concern. And that usually means that it's going to come out in some sort of other behavior that is likely equally or more undesirable than the original. Um, so biggest things, make sure you're checking, uh, consulting with a veterinarian to rule out any physical issues and then addressing any potential medication needs that you might need to address. Um, so this is a quick video, if it'll play, let's see here, of a compulsive behavior that's actually really common. So this is a dog demonstrating a suckling behavior. Uh, so he's sucking on and kneading on that blanket. It's very common uh, when we see dogs that either did not have a mother growing up or were taken away too early. That's one of the most common factors that can exacerbate this type of condition. Um, in some cases, it can be a, a stress behavior they develop later on. Um, I actually have a dog who came from a puppy mill. Uh, she was taken away from her mom very, very young. She's a compulsive suckler. Um, and it's a behavior that for her is soothing. So for her, she does that when she's stressed out and she needs to calm down. So we allow it to continue in our house, but because I didn't really appreciate my comforter on my bed being soaked all the time, I actually helped train her. So she has her own pillow. So she has a pillow in the house. When she's upset, she can go suck on her pillow and nobody bothers her <laughs> and it makes her happy. So she needs her pillow, she sucks on and then she usually falls asleep. That's fine. It's something that we can manage in terms of compulsive behavior. She's not hurting anybody. She's not hurting herself. So we can just let that go ahead and continue just in a managed way because I would prefer she not suck on all of my blankets and, and clothes in my house. <laughs> Let's see. There we go. So again, the end note for behavioral disorders is make sure you're seeking professional help. Uh, you're always going to start with a veterinarian. And if you are seeking out a trainer or a behavioral consultant, you'll know that they're worth their salt if the first words out of their mouth are, have you seen a veterinarian? So that's where you need to start always. Rule out any physical issues that might be causing behavior. Make sure you're addressing with a veterinarian uh, if there's any sort of pharmaceutical support. And then you're going to seek out a training or behavioral plan. Okay. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. I am sorry, I am notorious for running over and I did it again today, I apologize. Uh, but if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Okay, so we have our first question. Um, comfort signal, would it be different by breeds? My dog rarely shows relaxed open mouth. I only see that when she is hot, but yeah. she rescued her just recently, a few weeks ago. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, so again, a lot of these signals are generalized. This is what we generally see in dogs, um, but there's going to have to be some consideration for specific breeds. Um, so again, bully breeds, Rottweilers, um, some hounds, they naturally tend to have a, a tighter, more closed mouth. Uh, a lot of little dogs do as well. So if you don't see that big, happy, open mouth, that's okay if that's what's normal for your dog. Uh, one of my kids actually doesn't give me a whole, oops, sorry, let's go back there. It doesn't give me a lot of open, happy mouth, and that's just him. Um, so he's the guy that's sitting all the way over here in the corner looking kind of serious already in the picture. I don't see a lot of happy, open mouth for him, but that's normal, that's normal for him. So uh, once you identify what is normal for your dog, you can use that then to kind of gauge their, um, their mental state in different environments. Um, if you're not seeing a lot of that open, relaxed mouth, I would start looking at other, other physical signs. Do we still see that bouncy, inefficient mood? 
movement? Do we see that loose wagging tail? Do we see body weight kind of evenly distributed in a relaxed posture? Those are all things that'll let you know that your dog is comfortable, even if they're not giving you that nice open mouth. Okay, hey, our next question is, do you have any recommendation for uh, nail trimming? I know that's very <laughs> stressful for dogs. <laughs> yes, so nail trimming is intensely stressful for dogs. Um, and if your dog doesn't like it, you are not doing anything wrong. Um, so I always tell people nail trimming is really hard because dogs are, well, I mean, they're animals, they're going to rely on instinctive needs, and they know they need their paws for survival. So to ask them to give us a paw, let us squeeze it, and then start trimming pieces off of it, that's a big ask for dogs, and they're usually not super comfortable with it. Um, so what I always advocate for is doing a little desensitization and a little counter conditioning. So dogs don't like to have their paws touched. We need to start there. So hang out with your dog, sit on the floor, you're going to touch a paw and you want to let them know that that's a behavior that gets them a reward. So I always recommend using a marker. So touch a paw and say yes. Or if you've got a clicker on hand, if you've done clicker training, click after you've touched the paw, give them a treat. Uh, the key there is you want to touch the paw and then remove your hand before they've pulled away and you're marking that allowing of touch. Uh, and then as they get more comfortable with that touch, you can start to increase um, the length of time you're touching. Then you can start adding in a little bit of a squeeze. Then you can start kind of sticking fingers between toes, maybe holding on to the nail. Um, all of those things can help make them more comfortable. Uh, one of the biggest things that I have to advocate for there is if your dog wants to get away, let them get away. Um, so for my dogs, for example, when we do nail trims, I ask them to lay down and they'll lay down on their side. If for whatever reason they become uncomfortable um, or they just decided they're kind of done with their nail trims, if they sit up, then we're done. So once they've rolled up and moved away from me a little bit, we're all done. I don't push it. We can always go back and trim more nails later on. Um, but that's one of the biggest things that we see um, issues with with nail trimming is most dogs have had a bad experience. So either we've accidentally quicked them, we've cut the nail too short, and we've actually hurt them. So now they know that nail trimmers are a bad thing. Um, or they've gone to the vet, for example, and I'm not criticizing vets, they're doing their job. Uh, but vet techs have actually physically held the dog down and the nail trim has become about force. So a lot of times we have to work to correct that. And that's through a lot of positive associations with interactions with their paws. So quick touch, you get a treat. Quick touch, you get a treat. And then you can start upping the ante as they get more comfortable. Um, in the interim, if your dog becomes, uh, well, the nails become long and they need a trim and you know that they need it, but you don't want to backpedal on your training, a couple tricks that I have used, I take my dogs to tennis courts on occasion. Um, so tennis courts are very, very rough. So if you've got one that's all the way fenced in, you have to do this either with the permission from whoever owns that court or sneak in when nobody's around. I turn my dogs loose. We'll play 10 minutes of fetch on that tennis court and running on that rough surface. Their nails are actually filed down very nicely. Um, so that is kind of a quick and dirty trick to get your nails trimmed uh, while you're working on comfort with handling paws. Um, you can also make your dogs an emery board. Um, so I've done this with a lot of dogs. I'll take um, just a piece of wood and I'll wrap uh, saw paper or sorry, uh, sanding paper, uh, sandpaper around it. Um, and I will actually reward my dog for touching their paw to that paper. And you can actually create a dog that scratches at that post with the sandpaper around it, just like a cat scratches at a scratching post and it can file down their nails in the interim. Uh, but nail trimming is all about trust. They have to be comfortable, comfortable, comfortable with you touching their paws. And they have to know that when they're not, that you'll let them get away. Uh, and that will start to decrease the tension in that um, in that event. The one thing I have to please say nobody do, because I've seen it all over the internet, it's become sort of a sensation. Please don't put saran wrap around your head and put peanut butter on your forehead for your dog to lick while you're trimming their nails. Uh, that's a thing I've seen multiple times on Facebook and I am terrified. So you're putting your dog in a highly stressful situation. You're encouraging them to put their face by your face. That is asking for a bite. So we definitely want to avoid that behavior. However, I am not opposed to using food as a distraction. Uh, so with my dogs, I do have one that's still working on comfort during nail trims. I use a licky mat, uh, which is just a flat mat that's got some grooves on it. I smear peanut butter or cream cheese on it. Usually I freeze it. I'll put that on the floor for her and I'll let her get really invested in licking off all those yummy, yummy things. And then while she's doing that, I'll sneak around and start sort of trimming her nails. And then if she shakes her paw and looks at me, I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Go back to your licky mat and I'll let her relax and get back into that food treat. And then I'll try again. That was great advice. Thank you. Our next question, um, can you address stress in car rides and how to counter condition to make this easier on the dog? Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, one thing to look at, which will sometimes change my answer, is is your dog stressed because they're 
fearful of the car or are they stressed because they're super jazzed and excited? Um, but either way, one of the biggest things to do is start working with the car when you're not planning on going for a drive. Uh, so you're going to have your car in your driveway, you're going to bring your dog out, and we're going to do, so I do see the mention of counter conditioning. So it is a bit of counter conditioning coupled with a training technique called shaping. So we want to start forming a positive relationship between the dog and the car. So have your car in your driveway, bring your dog out on a leash. If your dog turns and looks at the car, you're going to mark that behavior. So you can say, yes, good. Or if you've got a clicker and you're comfortable, you're going to click and they get a treat. So they get a treat for looking at the car, for acknowledging that the car exists. They get a treat if they orient their body towards the car. If they step towards the car, you can open the door. If they jump into the car, they get a treat. Um, but one of the biggest things to do to start reducing stress, whether it's excitement or fear, is two short training sessions where you don't go anywhere. So you get in the car, you get a treat, you get out of the car, you get a treat, and then we go on a walk or we go play in the backyard or we do something fun without that stress of travel. Uh, and then you can start upping the ante with your dog. So you always wanna start small and then increase the criteria that you're asking your dog to perform. So you might ask them to get in the car and then you shut the doors and then maybe back down the driveway or you drive down the street and back again and then let them out. So let them know that the visits are short um, and they get to go home, uh, which is usually a major stressor for dogs. Every time they get in the car, they don't know if they get to come home again. Um, so that can be scary for them or frustrating. Uh, and you also wanna make sure that you do, when you get to the point where they can go out on lengthier car rides, vary your destinations. Uh, so I work with a lot of people that have struggled, their dogs never wanna get in the car because the only time they get in the car is once a year when they go to the vet. So of course they don't wanna get in the car. That's a bummer. They get shots when they get in the car, they're not gonna do it. You know, so start changing it up. Take them for a drive, you know, go through a drive through Even if you don't get them anything, all of those smells from like McDonald's, for example, is super enriching for your dog. That's fun for them to smell all of those things. Go through a drive through and then go home, you know, or if you're up for it, you know, get them a small treat. Um, you know, all of my local Starbucks, they know my car now and they've got puppuccinos ready for me because they know my dogs are in the car and we're trying to form a positive relationship with that car ride. So they get a little whipped cream treat, you know, something small that's not going to do them any harm, uh, but it helps them form that positive relationship relationship with the car. Um, car rides can take a lot of work uh, to, to get a dog desensitized and comfortable with cars, but if you're patient and you work on it over time, you'll have a positive result. And I tell people all the time, it's worth it to put in the effort and, and take the weeks or months because getting in a car is something a dog's going to have to do for the entirety of their life. So if it takes you two or three months to get them comfortable, it's worth it because then you've got 12 years of easy riding. So. Thank you. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. If we see a dog hard stare at another dog, what can we do to distract or break it up? Okay. Um, so that will depend if it's on leash or off. So if it's on leash and you've actually got a little bit more physical control over your dog, I would immediately recommend changing directions, for example. Um, so when I work with my dogs on leash, I have taught them a cue that means we're going somewhere else. So they automatically look at me because they know we're changing directions. So when I'm walking with my dogs and I say this way, they go, where are we going? Um, and I'll do that a lot. I have a dog that's a little reactive on leash and we're working on that. So if she sees another dog and I start to see that tension, I might see those pupils dilate a little bit. I say this way and she'll turn to look at me because we're going to go across the street or we're going to turn around or we're going to just change direction. So on leash, I would recommend something like that. If it's loose, so you've got two dogs maybe playing or you're at a dog park, uh, you want to start first with a sharp, sudden noise. Um, so I will do a quick hey with a little bit more zest behind it. I don't want to deafen anybody, but I'll do a quick hey. Um, or I'm a big fan. Um, the few times I've gone to a dog park or uh, I work with, a lot with dogs at the shelter that might be meeting each other for the first time. One thing I always keep in our exercise pens at the shelter is a metal bowl. So if dogs start to hard stare at each other, or I think they're approaching and maybe doing, um, maybe inclined towards a, a fight or something like that, I'll take the bowl and I'll just bang it against the fence really quick. It's a sharp, sudden noise that they don't hear often. And I see dogs go, oh, and they look away. And that buys me precious seconds to physically separate them. Um, so those are good tactics. If you start to see dogs hard stare, you just want to make sure that after they reorient themselves, so if they're hard staring at a dog and you've made a sharp noise, you've given them that cue to turn around if they're on leash, the minute that they turn to look at you, there has to be a reward system in place. They get paid for looking at you rather than paying attention to whatever it was that was causing them agitation. Um, 
So I always, and I tell everyone, when you walk, you should walk with treats. You don't need to give them all the time, but you need to have something on board uh, in case there is a high stress situation. So my dog, for example, that's reactive, if she gets really fixated, that's a struggle for her. That's hard for her to turn around and look at me. So when she does, she gets cheese and she knows that she gets cheese. So looking at me is now way cooler and more fun than getting tense at that dog that's down the street. Okay. Thank you so much, Andy. This has yeah. been wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you at our next pet chat um, where Andy will be doing do-it-yourself enrichment toys for your animals. So uh, if you have any last minute questions, you can respond to the email that was sent out and we will make sure that Andy gets it. So thank you all. Please stay safe and healthy out there and have a great night. Yeah.